This month marks three years of the United Party for National Development, UPND's governors. They came into power in August of 2021. The party was elected on a platform of change after a period of ongoing economic decline and poor governance under the PF administration where corruption became deeply rooted and institutionalized, leading to a loss of public trust in governance institutions, among other consequences. President Hijilema has part of his strategy promised that the fight against corruption would be systematic and professional, making corruption an attractive option. He vowed that those who took what did not belong to them would be made to return it and stressed that the fight would be neither vindictive nor selective. Three years down the line, this fight has seen the resignation of the ACC or Anti-Corruption Director General as well as the dissolution of the anti-corruption board with others calling for the naming and shaming of top government officials including ministers involved in present-day corruption tonight we seek answers to question on whether we are on the right track in fighting corruption under the UPND administration and whether this fight is truly free from vindictiveness and welcome to Costa with me, Costa Monster. Remember that you're catching us live on channel 271 on DSTV, it's channel 20 on GoTV. If you're unable to catch us due to load shedding, remember you can also subscribe to our YouTube page, it's Diamond TV Zambia, and you can catch the live stream. We're also giving an opportunity by subscribing to walk away with a Diamond Media Power Bank to power your gadget and indeed walk away with uh, internet worth a month's free data courtesy of Zantel. My guest this evening on the program is prominent constitutional lawyer John Sangwa, State Council. State Council, it was a pleasure to host you and good evening. Good evening, thank you. I think from my introduction, real, it's, it's, it's very clear. Um, let's, let's start from just your own summative overview of how you would describe the last three years of um, the UPND administration. I know we're discussing the fight against graft, but so many things have happened in terms of the economy, governance, rule of law, and so on. What is your take on the last three years? Well, that is something that may take uh, hours to, uh, to, to, to summarize, uh, but unfortunately it is one of disappointment and I think there are many people that expected quite a lot from this government and um, people are disappointed and I think I'm one of those people that are equally disappointed in terms of the performance of this government in the last um, uh, three years. Uh, let me qualify that. I think when we say we're disappointed, nobody expected that all the challenges which, we, which the government inherit, inherited in 2021 were going to be solved overnight. No, that was not the expectation. But expectation at the very least was to uh, say that the government was going to turn the country and point it in a, in a, in a, in a different direction. And that has not happened. And I think that is where, for me, the disappointment comes from. Let's zero in on the issue of you know, governance in relation to the fight against corruption. Like I said, at the hilt of 2021, uh, the ruling party then and the government, the PF, mm -hmm. had been painted with a corrupt brush that you know, this was a party or a government of really looters mm -hmm. and they were running our coffers dry. Three years down the line, one would argue that uh, 
we, we, we have not seen this corruption being brought to light or its conclusiveness in the aspect of convictions or matters that really point to the fact that, yes, the PF was corrupt. President Hitchinam himself and a couple of his ministers have attributed the fact that it's not easy. It's, it's a complicated you know, a process to fight corruption, mm. um, especially when monies are involved, when commercial transactions are involved. So you cannot in three years really say you've rooted out corruption. Mm. Again, what is your take on efforts or strides made in the last three years on the corruption stage? Mm. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you go to, I think it should be page 15 of the UPND manifesto, mm. I mean, they clearly stated that they'll have, um, they'll implement a policy of zero, zero tolerance for corruption. And then they also talked about the fact that they'll make sure that those that pay, play by the rules are rewarded and those that engage in corruption are punished. That uh, they, they made it clear that they'll make it difficult or painful to engage in corruption. Now, these were just statements now but uh, it clearly spelled that in the manifesto, but that is just the beginning. So the expectation was, how then do you realize those ideals? Now, what was expected was, first of all, once in government, for the government to be able to, to set out a clear sense, a clear policy direction in terms of how they are going to achieve those, uh, those goals. And what is evident is that they walked into government and they have done nothing, okay? Because first of all, you can't fix a problem you don't know. You needed to understand, first of all, why was there corruption under his predecessor's reign? What were the shortcomings? What, what prompted corruption and so forth? And then it is only when you know what the problems are will you be able to prescribe the treatment, okay? Now, if, if you look at it, nothing has happened, both in terms of institutional reforms, nothing institutionally has changed from uh, 2021 to date. And that is one of the things that one was expected to do. There's been no legal reform, no institutional change, no institutional reform, no legal reform. So there is no way you can say that you have made progress because what was required to happen was to dismantle the institutions that enabled corruption under his predecessor's reign, reform those institutions, and then be able to point the country in the, in, in the, in the right direction. But all those structures that uh, allowed or facilitated corruption under his predecessor's reign, they're still intact. Mm. So basically what they have done is basically to inherit and return the, the, the structures and institutions that facilitate Are the corruption. Are you saying then tonight, State Council, that we do not have robust or adequate, you know, laws or legal framework to fight corruption in the current state? Others would argue that under this administration, we've seen the introduction of these so-called fast-track courts uh, on, on, on financial mm -hmm. crimes. Um, the president and the chief justice uh, are, are agreeing that um, they would uh, ex expedite cases in five months, uh, some of these things, whether happening or not, uh, and also pointing to the fact that um, uh, some of the, the, the barometer they, they, they're using, like the Corruption Perception Index, shows that Zambia has been improving on its score in the last decade. So wh when you say there's lack of reforms, what about the aspect of even increased budgeting allocation towards the ACC? I'll come, I'll mm. come to that. Mm. You see, you need to understand why is there corruption in the first place. Okay? Until you answer that question, you're not able to address the problem. Okay? The issue of corruption is both a legal and a moral problem. Okay, so once you understand that, and only then will you be able to address that problem. Now, we haven't had any uh, discussion, for instance, to be able to identify, uh, by the way, if I may qualify that, the fight against corruption is not just a responsibility of government. Okay, it is the responsibility of each and every Zambian to be able to join in the fight against corruption. Here's a problem with institutional failure. The law as it stands right now 
it is designed to punish corruption. But there are no structures or laws in place to prevent corruption. So the most effective way to fight corruption is to have a two-pronged approach. One, where you first of all put in measures to prevent people from get, get engaging in, cor in corrupt practices. So that prosecution is left for those that uh, the first system has failed to catch, okay? Then in the process, you're going to have fewer cases to, to, to be able to prosecute. So that there's always a saying, prevention is always better than, than uh, finding a cure after the effect. So our system of, find, of fighting corruption is designed, it basically tells you, go ahead, take bribes, involve in yourself in corruption, just make sure you don't get caught. So how do we then prevent corruption from that two-pronged approach? What, is, what are you proposing? Oh, what should the policy or legal framework okay. be looking like? <laughs> you know, the problem is this country is 60 years old, right? And unfortunately, every president that comes to power, they think they are more intelligent than their predecessors, or they know better, or they are finding certain things that uh, their predecessors did not know. If you look at it, if you go back into history, you'll find that uh, uh, from 64 to 91, we had Kaunda's government, right? Then from 91 to 2021, we had the MMD government, to 2011, we had the MMD government, right? If you look at each and every political party that has come into power, there's been subsequent attempt to prosecute people for corruption. For example, people were prosecuted during the 10 years of uh, Chiluva's government under President Mwanawasa. Then President Mwanawasa and his term was completed by President Rupia Banda. Certain people under, during, who were in office during that time were prosecuted under President Sat. Now we have had 10 years of PF. Now these people who served under PF are now being prosecuted under this government. There is one anomaly that you find there. That is, the people that served under Kaunda, nobody was ever prosecuted for corruption. Okay? Is it to say that there was no corruption in the UNIP government? Kaunda was far more effective, more effective in, prevention? in preventing corruption. Okay? You have to go back into history. First of all, the issue of corruption is not new. It is something that he made soon after independence. If you go back into history, you'll find that as at 1972, people were already talking about corruption because they realized that certain people whom they knew, all of a sudden after, gov after getting into government, they, become, they became wealthy. If you check the report of the Toronto Commission, which was published in 1973, they noted that Pro corruption was a problem. And that is how they came up with the creation of the Office of the uh, Investigator General. The primary function of the Office of uh, Investigator General was to address the issue of corruption. But Kaunda went further by providing for what they described as the leadership code. Okay? Under that leadership code, people that were employed in government, central government, local government, statutory bodies, parastatals, were all required to declare their assets and liabilities. But that is still the case now. No, it's not. Mm. It's not. It's not. If you work for, for a parastatal, for example, there is no obligation on you to, to declare your assets. Mm. Under counter it was. If you work for a statutory body, it was mandatory for you to declare your assets. Not only your assets, you also had to declare the assets that are registered in the name of your wife. Mm. Okay? In addition, counter went further to create a tribunal where somebody would actually report the person that he suspects is involved in corrupt practices so that that tribunal can investigate those allegations. If you submit a false declaration, that in itself was, uh, was an offense, and you would actually be penalized for that. So we don't have, so the, the, to be effective, we should have a system in place requiring each and every person that is employed by government central government, local government, 
statutory bodies, uh, commissions, including parastatals. For example, if you work for Zesco, mm -hmm. there should be a requirement for you to declare your assets. What about the so-called integrity committees that exist within these government structures? We see through Secretary to Cabinet and in these parastatals that they have now a, co a corruption you know, um, whether I can just call it loose, the corruption code um, and conditions of service in terms of what you are not supposed to receive as gifts and what you're supposed to declare. But by and large, they call these integrity committees. They're not effective enough? They're not effective. How much have we, have we heard in terms of what their successes and failures? What, what have they achieved? They've achieved nothing. Now, what is required as the first uh, line to try and address corruption there should be a requirement for people to disclose. Those that don't want to disclose, then they shouldn't be employed in their public service. Yes. Then the question is, if, 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 if that was a system that was working in yes. preventing corruption, yes. at what point and why then did we do away with it? But that is why I started by saying, for some reason, because you see, if you put that system in place, you know it would be very difficult for people to engage in corruption. Okay? It was removed in order to facilitate corruption. And so what is required, if any government is serious, you have to restore that system. Mm. So you, you said fighting corruption is both a legal but also a moral yes. uh, aspect. Yes. There have been concerns, and I'll quote, you know, State Council Musa Mwenye, who uh, spoke, you know, strongly after uh, the, 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 the board of the ACC that he was chairing was dissolved. Mm -hmm. One of the issues he cited, he strongly is calling for lifestyle audit but supports this argument of leaders in mm -hmm. public office declaring mm -hmm. their assets. Mm -hmm. He himself put himself on the line saying before he went into the ACC, he declared, and after he has declared. Mm -hmm. There's this question that the law right now does not mandate for the president to declare assets uh, only at the point when he's standing for elections and he's to the ECZ, and again, the ECZ is not mandated to publish. Mm. How, from a moral perspective or a legal perspective, is the importance, if we are serious, that mm -hmm. starting from the head of state, mm -hmm. these declarations need to be made? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's why I say that uh, fighting corruption is both legal and moral. By moral, I meant if you are the head of state, you must lead by example. Okay, you can't provide exceptions. Okay, and that, that is uh, what is required because we already kn we know how destructive corruption is. We know how, you know, one of the saddest thing for me, I look at it to say anybody that engages in corruption is basically an enemy of the country. Okay, because uh, if I'm sure you, you, you'll have noticed from the FIC report and from other experiences, you find that in fact the bulk of the proceeds uh, from corruption is actually, the bulk of it is actually externalized. So effectively, we as a people, we are allowing money that is supposed to benefit our country to go outside and develop other countries. I mean, that is the worst form of unpatriotism. Un now, the first thing that we need to understand is that only Zambians can develop Zambia. And for that reason, it is imperative. And that is why I said that the fight against corruption is not only a government fight. It is the fight of each and every person. Now, what we need to do then is to provide a mechanism, a mechanism to prevent corruption. For instance, if you are working for Zesco, uh, this is just an example. You are required to submit, to declare your assets and liabilities. Why? Because you, you work for uh, an entity where government has an interest. Now, when you have those rules in place, I may be your neighbor. I might see all of a sudden, I know you work for Zesco, and all of a sudden you have this massive amount of wealth from nowhere. I should be at liberty to report you to the tribunal. Can you look into my neighbor? I don't think at all whatever is happening in terms of all of a sudden, he had this uh, building that was at uh, foundation level, and within six months, this mansion springs up. Now, 
when, then you, you, you have a tribunal where you can report to. Citizens can report these uh, activities that are uh, corruption related. Is this not what the Whistleblowers Act tends no, that's, to do? That, that's totally mm. different. Mm. That is totally different. What is required, first of all, is to have these regulations, okay, uh, that govern all these people in public institutions. So this should be internal tribunals or sitting with No, 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 external, mm. external, okay, external, separate, okay, where anybody with information can take the information to the tribunal. Now, this is, you see, you cannot just put regulations. You must find a way to enforce those regulations. So the tribunal comes in to enforce those regulations. Now, if you know that you have declared your assets, Okay. By the way, even when you have transfers your you have transferred your assets, if you look at the leadership code under UNIP, you are required to file an amendment. Okay? And you are not even for, for example, it's not just about declaring your own assets, even the assets that are in, in your wife's name. Again, it was also a breach of the code for you, for example, to transfer uh, assets in the name of your daughter or your son in order to comply with the requirements. Okay? So we have had experience with this uh, kind of arrangement. I know what we need to do is to revamp this. Now, these are measures that are designed to prevent corruption. Now, if you know that there is this system in place. You'll have to think twice before you can get you can take, uh, you can get involved in corruption. Coming into present day, you know, happenings. Uh, you, you're saying this is not what exactly the whistleblowers, you know, act is doing. But we've seen people being reported that so and so has a hundred houses, and so um, even the ACC would come out publicly through the press to say we're investigating X, Y, and so because they've got over a hundred houses. Embarrassingly, later on, you find there's less than five houses. Yes. So, so this issue of whistleblowing um, sometimes is it not a, just a, a waste of resources in that some of this information is not accurate and verified. No, but, but also remember, uh, the, the, if you look at the, the regulations, there is actually a penalty if you make a false report. It's not just something that you can walk up, walk up and say, I'm going to make allegations. Under the current again. situation? No, no, no. no. Based I'm on the talk, tribunal that you're talking yes, about? Yes, under the, under the UNIP arrangement. Okay, there was that safeguard. So meaning that even for me to report you, I must make sure that I've done my homework. And I know that this is not just being driven by vindictiveness. But these were measures designed. The first and most important thing is to get all these people to disclose their assets, to declare their assets. Mm -hmm. Let, let, let's talk about this issue of declaration. I know for elected officials like MPs mm -hmm. and the president, mm -hmm. they go through the process uh, in 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 the uh, what is the in the. Um, what do you call it, when they are filing, in the filing yes, yes. in process with yes. the ECZ, they, yes. they, 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 they declare. Yes. When, if they are elected, mm -hmm. I know for MPs and ministers, they, they are mandated through the courts to, mm -hmm. to file in. We've tried to do our own search, very few MPs, very few ministers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The fact that the president hasn't done so, and others argue that he's not mandated by law, does it show moral weakness yes. in him being serious to the fight against yes. Corruption. Yes, yes. Would corruption go away if President Hitchlama today declared his assets? No, I, I, I think we, we, you see, corrupt, what we're talking about, first of all, you can't eradicate corruption, right? What you can do is to contain it. <coughs> Now, what you don't want is, you don't want to normalize corruption. Now, as it is right now, corruption is normal, okay? And those are the problems that we're talking about. Now, first of all, let me clear this issue. The declarations you're talking about is limited to elected officials, okay? Now, how many elected officials are inv uh, involved in this country? We're talking about 140? Uh, 150 what? 150 MPs. MPs. Now, are you saying these are the only people involved in corruption? Of course not. Certainly, you've got a okay. huge civil service yes. handling public money. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that anybody, anybody employed in the public sector must declare his or our assets. 
and liabilities. That should be a mandatory requirement if you are serious about fighting corruption. If you work for a parastato, you should declare your assets. If you work, even say, for example, take under UNIB, if you work for UNSA, for example, you are required to, de to declare your assets, okay? Provided you are working for a government institution or, go or an institution that receives government funding, you are required to do that. If you are not interested in declaring your assets, then leave the public sector and go into the private sector because then there won't be any obligation for you to disclose your assets, okay? That is one way in which we are likely to contain. Now, there is a reason why you have to declare. When you declare, that becomes the starting point. We will now say, wait a minute, how come you now have this? Your declaration says this. In the absence of a declaration, somebody can cook up a story as to where he got the money and everything else. But that declaration is a starting point. And when you acquire more assets, you also have to update that declaration. Okay? So that when you appear before the tribunal, you can now say the tribunal has a starting point. It can say, listen, uh, uh, Mr. Mwansa, this is what you declared. How come we have now found that you have this, you have this? Now, that becomes your reference point. No, I acquired this subsequently, but why didn't you update your requirement? So that measure is designed to prevent corruption, to serve as a deterrent. As long as people involved in uh, employed by government, employed in statutory bodies, employed in parastatos, employed in local authorities, are not required to, to, to uh, are not required by law to declare the assets, the whole fight against corruption is a joke. That's the proposal you are making, but uh, I'd like it to look. Uh, I'd like us to look at it this in, in, in two ways. Unfortunately for Zambia, if we, we we want to gauge or say we're winning the fight against corruption, it, it, we we call for the blood or conviction of politically aligned figures. Just like mm -hmm. you've given your historical perspective, that mm -hmm. government in, government out, mm -hmm. only those that served in the previous are being, you know. Um, mm prosecuted mm -hmm. and rightfully so they are not the only ones as elected officials handling mm -hmm. or with access to public money mm -hmm. um, the question therein lies in, in, in the aspect of look at the FIC report in the most recent one an increase of 133 percent mm -hmm. the Auditor General's report mm -hmm. glaring revelations year in year out mm -hmm. in the education sector ghost workers on the payroll uh, procurement that's the biggest you know corruption mm -hmm. haven mm -hmm. but we we, we fight corruption from the basis on of if this political figure is convicted then then we're winning mm -hmm. well, we should be shooting in the wrong direction of course I mean and that is why I'm saying <laughs> that all, when uh, uh, the president declared the fight against corruption, that was just a slogan now here is a problem <laughs> about about this why this fight is 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 not serious uh, corruption under PF right it's already done these people have already stolen money they have already taken money they have already taken their bribes the damage is already done so you have two kinds of corruption. There is past corruption and ongoing corruption. Now, the most harmful corruption is not the past corruption. It is the corruption that is happening now. So any serious government should be able to say, you know what, because now you are trying to rebuild the country. Now, as you are rebuilding, you can't have people now start chopping down, uh, stealing and involving in corruption and everything else. So if anything, the greatest attention should be paid to the current corruption, meaning that you have to put robust measures to prevent current corruption. Now, past corruption, mm -hmm. you have to, first of all, those are crimes, right? There's no, there's no limitation. You can always follow up the guys later. Uh, and you can, whatever, if you're talking about, uh, re and then that becomes a matter of uh, recoveries and conviction and so forth. But the most harmful corruption is what is happening today. We, we cannot have this discussion, State Council, without addressing the elephant in the room, like you say, present-day corruption. Yes. What has happened at the ACC is obviously as a result of that damning, you know, uh, letter or, or revelation that mm -hmm. was released by one Dr. O'Brien Carver, mm -hmm. who was serving as a commissioner mm -hmm. on the ACC board. Mm -hmm. Days after
after. Um, we are told impeccably that um, the former board had engaged State House with the report on the fact that they felt sidelined on, on, on investigations mm -hmm. involving government officials, including aspects of forfeiture mm -hmm. that the Director General was involved in, mm -hmm. and he blatantly refused to report and inform the board, and they mm -hmm. didn't want to rubber stamp issues in such a manner. Mm -hmm. He resigns, or mm -hmm. we are told he's forced to resign. Mm -hmm. A day later, the board is dissolved. Mm -hmm. The former chairperson is saying more can be done, and we need to name and shame those involved in current corruption. Mm -hmm. Was forcing the, the, the former DG to resign and dissolving the board a win or showing that this administration is serious <laughs> with, with, with corruption? Uh, well... That incident, if, if, if you had a very clear direction on how to fight uh, corruption, that incident would, should not have happened. The fact that it happened shows you that the whole fight against corruption is, is basically, is not a serious fight. Let's go back to that particular incident. That incident reveals two things. First of all, there is a major flaw in the law. Right? In terms of the relationship of the uh, Director General of ACC and the board, there's a problem there, which, uh, like I said, when you're a new government, you should have carried out a review to find out, first of all, is ACC effective? And if it is effective, yes, you continue. But if it is not effective, find out why it is not effective. The fight that you saw between the board and the DG is a product of the law, okay? It is, it is a, a, a problem that is created by the law. If you look at it, uh, for example, the current Anti-Corruption uh, anti uh, Act was enacted, I think, in 2012. It creates a board. Now, if you check the law, nowhere in that law does it say the DG is answerable to the board. It doesn't. Okay. Who is the D director general of the ACC answerable to? The law doesn't say. B because w w we've been fighting for a law that creates autonomy, not even to report to the president, unfortunately, who is the appointing authority. Yeah. Yet we talk about autonomy through parliamentary ratification. Mm -hmm. but, but you still see the hand of the presidency. Okay, I'll, I'll come to that point. Mm. But you see, th there is a problem which is a legal problem, a structural problem. That should have been addressed. Now, if you go back, first of all, this, uh, this law to do, to do with the anti-corruption uh, anti was, it was, uh, six, that law was changed. Now, in 1996, the law was very clear as to the position of the, the, the commissioners. There was no board under the 1996 Act. So the commission consisted of the commissioners. The commissioners were the commission. And the director general was basically an employee of the commission. Okay? Therefore, under that arrangement, you have a stronger commission, and the commissioners have direct control over the affairs of the commission, and the DG reported to the commissioners. Now, some genius came up, I don't know how, who came up with this brilliant idea of, instead of commissioners comprising the board, uh, commissioners comprising the commission, they now created a board of commissioners. Now, that created a problem. Now, having created that, they failed to define the relationship between the DG and the board. Now, remember, so both you're saying that the law at present is silent on who the Director General of the Anti-Corruption Commission reports to. That's where the problem is. Because, for instance, if, let's say, I don't know whether, uh, if you look at Section, uh, I think it should be Section 9 of the Act, it says the DG shall have control, control over a control, direction, management, and administration of the commission. That's what it says. And what does it say in relation to the role of the board, then? Why have a board of commissioners? It's, it's basically the... the, the Is it not to oversee? No, no, it doesn't say that. If I have control, where do you come in? 
The law says I have control. The law says the DG has control over the commission. Surely it should have something said to, to, to bring a board to life. No, it doesn't. <laughs> there should be a legal provision <laughs> as, to, as to how commissioners of the board are appointed and definitely what their roles and responsibility. Anyway, maybe you, you, are, you have a look at the act. Mm. And that is where the problem has arisen. Okay? So you now have, now the impression created is like the board is simply there for policy. Okay, and then which the which the, the which uh, the commission uh, the DG has to implement, but the control, direction, and management and administration of the commission is the responsibility of the DG. That is the mess which exists so, so, in the so, law. So former DG Tom Shamakamba had no really. Uh, had no mandate or was not mandated to be reporting to the board. He had no obligation, no obligation. according to the law. Yeah. I'm in control. I'm in control. Why should I report to you? That's what the act says. Okay? But previously, under the 1996 Act, it was different. So the Act has gone various, trans, uh, uh, various uh, pro, uh, uh, repeal and reenactment. Now, this is what should have been done. But back to this case. Yes. We, we, we had a UPND that was obviously, like I said in my introduction, inheriting a government, and insofar as corruption was concerned, confidence, public confidence was really eroded mm -hmm. in these institutions, especially the ACC, mm -hmm. that they were failing to prosecute mm -hmm. the issue of the, 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 the 51 houses and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, three years down the line, you dissolve a board when you told us you look at the quality of the men and women of integrity I'm putting in these you know, commissions, mm -hmm. and you, you have a DG resigning, you have the, uh, a former commissioner writing a damning report citing by name your solicitor general who sues before the court, later says, no, we're going into a consent. What, is, is this giving any confidence at all? I mean, okay, I mean, the, what you have summed up is chaos, okay? How, how do you have co confidence out of chaos? You can't. Yeah. Oh, what that, oh, what that whole scenario, all oh, that saga reveals is the incompetence and the lack of seriousness in addressing the issue of corruption, okay? But if people were serious, if this government was serious, it should have walked into office with a clear roadmap on how to contain corruption in this country. But there's no roadmap, nothing. Okay, one of the first things that they should have done, because you see, I mean, if you walk in here, you find, say, for example, your, this is your institution, there is hemorrhage everywhere, money is disappearing. What will be your first order of business? You need to sell the leaks. Exactly. That's what you do. It's a matter of common sense. It doesn't require a genius to know that. Okay? Why was there corruption under my predecessor's government? Where did my... But those are fundamental questions that anybody serious we should be able to ask. Are, are, we, are we stuck then? Because just last week, one of the headlines was Chief Justice Mumba Malila saying, we, 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 we can do better. Or we, could, we could do much more uh, on, on corruption. And, and is it convictions? Uh, his deputy was not <laughs> quite amused with the aspect of him saying convictions uh, in that light. But, but, but back to this issue, really. J just on that point, okay? Because also that tells you the level of chaos in the country and lack of seriousness. You know, there are basic concepts like separation of powers, okay? The Chief Justice should never, never have made those comments. Never. That's not his job, okay? He crossed the line. Now, it's a different thing if he wants to become a politician, then he has to resign that office and become a politician. Or if he doesn't want to become a politician, maybe become a cadre. But when you hold the office of chief justice, those statements should never come out of the mouth of a chief justice. The chief justice, the, the judiciary, has to be independent and impartial. The moment you start commenting on such matters, your impartiality is already 
tainted. That statement should never, never have been made. Now, that tells you the extent of the chaos you are wallowing in as a country. You know, because it's like uh, there are no laws. We, it's, it's like we're just in a jungle. Everybody can just stand up and say whatever they want to, to say. There are laws. We have laws in this country. Are we then saying that we are stuck as a country? Or the big question, I think, for me and, mm -hmm. and from the public is what next then for the ACC? It's, it's almost four, three to four weeks down the line. The president obviously is methodically uh, <laughs> looking at this. Um, some of his sympathizers or supporters will say, you will see who the president will now put at ACC. The, the fight will be more serious. No. Is it about the individuals or the framework? Well, it's about, it's, a, it's about both, okay? First of all, there is a problem. Uh, even the way, and this is where you have a problem. Remember, the DG is appointed by the president subject to ratification by the National Assembly. The commissioners are also appointed by the president subject to, <laughs> to, uh, subject to, uh, to ratification by the National Assembly, okay? Now, that in itself is chaotic. You can't have a situation like that. Ordinarily, in a proper functioning system, if you want to respect the concept of corporate governance and uh, to have an institution properly tick, it should be the responsibility of the commissioners to be able to appoint the DG. Okay? Now, that is already an institutional chaos, and uh, I do hope they'll be able to put uh, some amendment in the National Assembly and address, uh, and address that. But in the meantime, something else can be done, okay, to try and address these things. Because, you see, the process of appointment of both identification and uh, appointment of the DG and the commissioners, uh, in the meantime, if you have to fill up those offices, you have to find a different method. But, but certainly, you describe this as, as chaotic. Yes. Um, and like I was saying, it, it doesn't give confidence and stability that three weeks down the line, there's the silence. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming for what's left of whoever is acting at the ACC and the officers, mm. do they have a sense of direction? Because if a commissioner blows the whistle and then what you hear is the, the, the DG resigning, from the court of public opinion, you dissolve the board. It's like saying there was something amiss there. There was also something wrong. Others have been calling that there should be a, a, a commission of investigation or a tribunal to, to really investigate the state of the ACC. But in short, my question is, where are we right now? Is, is, is there any fight against corrupt? Is there an ACC? Who is, who is calling the shots? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that amplifies the point I was making of a complete lack of direction. Because, you see, uh, how do you have an ACC itself which is supposed to fight corruption embroiled in, in one, another form of corruption? That's the chaos I'm talking about. But this, first of all, you won't find men and women of caliber who will accept to be commissioners on the ACC in its current form. Okay. No person, no sane person of integrity and somebody who, has, who, has, who values his or her integrity will accept to work as a commissioner unless really you also want to go there and uh, join and also become part of the looting class. But so otherwise, if seen its current form is corrupt, it's ineffective. Mm -hmm. It can't work. Okay? It can't work. You can't be a commissioner and uh, have a DG you can't control. Okay? Then what are you there for? So you'll have to be crazy to accept an appointment in the first place. Okay? So uh, there is immediate need because the, the law, uh, there is a problem with the law. Sort out the law first. Okay? So that we make these changes. The weaknesses that have been revealed, you have to fix your ACC before you can even start talking about any serious fight against corruption. <laughs> this current administration, um, it in a way, presents itself through the president and the ministers that Zambians must be reminded of the past and the ills of the PF. 
to understand why we're in, in such a situation and the reason why they're taking such an approach to fix things according to them because there's been this argument to say the PF were voted based on that if we use a lens to analyze the PF and the UPND in the fight against corruption mm. uh, one would argue to say when whistles were blown in the Ministry of Health, whether he took so much time or not, President Lungu was bold enough to fire, you know, Chitalu Chilufia. Uh, you had Chitotel appearing before the courts as a minister, uh, as well as others. We've seen whistles being blown, though there's no matter before any court active. What the president is doing is he'll, he'll swap his ministers. We've mm. seen suspensions at, mm. at, at Zamsa. Again, when you go to history, whether it's the Kapoko or the, 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 the Global Fund issues, corruption in, in certain sectors, Ministry of Health, Education, this is not new. So maybe the PF was more serious in, in cracking <laughs> the whip based on such evidence. No. Uh, uh, first of all, we don't need to be reminded about the corruption in PF right that's why we kick them out we don't need to be reminded oh what we need to know up from this government what are you doing to fix the problem okay yes corruption has happened and so we know that's why we punish these guys now you guys you promised that you'll be able to do better than these guys uh, uh, they, 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 they told us uh, we were made to believe that we had reached the rock bottom uh, in terms of corruption under his predecessor's reign, only to realize that there is actually another bottom below the bottom where these guys have now sunk in. Now, that is what they have to, 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 to address, okay? They are now in charge, okay? President Lungu had his stint and everything else, and whatever history has recorded, whatever he did and failed to do. But these are the guys, uh, the president is the captain of the ship, and that ship is sinking in corruption. That is the problem. That is the issue that he has to address. But the biggest problem that I can tell you is that these guys walked into office without any clear roadmap on how to fight corruption. That's the problem. Okay. Is, is this current administration then rooted in corruption? Is that what you're saying? Listen, if you find a corrupt system, why would you retain it if you're not corrupt? Why? In fact, if you're not corrupt, you are clean, you're above board, the first thing you will do is to dismantle that system. But they have retained that system. Three years on, there's been, like I said, there's been no legal reform, there's been no structural or institutional reform in terms of fighting corruption. Mm -hmm. Everything is intact. One of the things that brings debate though it or, or difference of opinion though it's 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 enshrined in, in in a legal framework is the aspect of the forfeiture of crime of process of crimes act and i think this, these have been even the departure points that have caused this chaos um in in in, in the acc between the former dg and the former board uh in, in my investigations i'm told the board was questioning how does the dg arrive at uh, what i should call it a deal or negotiating uh, a, a consent that if somebody is found wanting in excess of say 60 million dollars and you accept to say you forfeit 20 or 21 million dollars again these are precedences we see being set at one press conference the president outrightly told us to say at no point did he himself or instruct any of his officials or whether it's his, uh, attorney general or his <laughs> state house officials to engage into any negotiations with a former liquidator of case CM. Mm -hmm. Months down the line, the Attorney General Chambers is entering into a concept and we're told again $26 million is, is being forfeited on, mm -hmm. on, on some miscalculation. Mm -hmm. Now the President starts to tell us, first of all, we, we want to, to take back what was stolen, then we prosecute, you know, criminally. Is there something wrong with this forfeiture act? There may be not, they, 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 there may be not, there may be nothing wrong with the act, right? The problem is always how you implement the act. Or is it being abused? Yes, it is abused. It is abused. The problem is more about abuse. I have never been a fan of that particular law because at the end of the day, there can be no forfeiture of an asset without a conviction. Okay? 
at the end of the day, the starting point is that whether you agree to, when you, if you agree to forfeit a certain asset, there must be an admission of guilt of having committed a crime. At the end of the day, you must have a criminal record. There is no way you can, I mean, it, it's just a nonsensical, it doesn't even make sense that somebody can agree to say, okay, I'm surrendering this money, and then I walk away a free person. Where? Where, where on earth is that even possible? Mm -hmm. Only in Zambia, the point which is the first in any, any properly run system, if you are serious about fighting corruption, the first thing is that you must admit that you committed a crime. Okay. Now, your for, your surrendering that asset can should only be considered as a way to mitigate the sentence or whatever the penalty that is supposed to happen. But there is no way you can admit of having committed an offence and then you simply pay the money and walk away. What you are basically sending the message is that you know what, if you have to get involved in corruption and everything, make sure the proceeds are huge so that at the end of the day, you simply surrender. Well, the message that out. is being sent to the public, really. In yes. Of all the prominent cases that have come out, is it the 65 million that was found in some home in Ibex Hill? Mm -hmm. The government says yes. Uh, this money uh, has been forfeited. We are going to pay school bursaries, and uh, probably that's the end we hear of it. Yeah. Um, we are told uh, the, the liquidator was uh, moving monies from KCM account into personal accounts. You will see what will be revealed. Let's just wait. Something is about to be told. The government is entering into a consent. The, the gold scandal, again, it was the same issue. We were being told Zambians should just wait and see what yeah. will happen. Yeah. We, 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 it, it, case has gone cold. Yes. And I, I, I'm happy that you gave history and you, you've been part of some of these things. It reminds me of Levi Mwanawasa's prosecution or persecution of former President Chiluba. What did we benefit as a country at the end of the day? Suits and shoes? It's the same thing we see now. We're just talking about 15 houses of the former first lady, houses of, uh, of a former minister, a helicopter. That's our fight against corruption. Yet the Auditor General's report and the FIC report tell you millions of kwacha being looted. Yeah. I mean, all oh, what you have summed up very well, I mean, answers the question. Does that tell you that the, the, that whoever is in government right now is serious about fighting corruption? No, it's a joke. They're not serious. Okay? They're not serious. Facts speak for themselves. There is nothing that has happened in the last three years that would give you confidence that we're on the right path in terms of fighting corruption. Okay? In fact, the truth of the matter is that these guys have just inherited the same institutions that facilitated corruption and simply perfected the institutions. That's what is happening. Away from the example that you gave in terms of what happened in the UNIP era of mm -hmm. declaration of assets mm -hmm. at, at all levels mm -hmm. within the civil service mm -hmm. and tribunals, mm -hmm. what then should we be doing at this moment if the system is not robust enough? Yeah, that would be the starting point, first of all, is to, 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 we should have this kind of conversation, first of all. Corruption should be raised so that it becomes part of the national conversation, okay? Because, I mean, I just fail to imagine how this is even possible, okay? Because these people that are involved in corruption are basically traitors to this country. You are damaging your own country. Okay, like I said, the bulk of the money is actually externalized. It goes to other countries, to develop other countries. That should never happen if we're dealing with people that are patriotic. Okay, we must understand that there is no one else that will come from somewhere else to develop Zambia. We have a responsibility to develop Zambia, which means that we have to look after each and every culture, each and every way to make sure that it is properly utilized and for the benefit of the country. Now, and all the resources, but for, if, even the resources, I mean, there was that story of that, uh, was it 60 million hectares of land? <laughs> Where on earth is that even humanly possible that you can decide 
to give away six million, I don't know, acres, 6.8 million. 6 million acres or hectares of your own land to a foreign investor. I mean, I, I mean, and these are normal human beings, and they can proudly talk about this as a deal. Characters like that are belong to, they're supposed to be in jail because these are saboteurs. They are damaging the country. You know, it's not even normal. The, 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 the government clarified that that was an intent, obviously, of which but the proposal has been rejected. First of all, why would you even entertain that? It's insane. It's insane. You know, if, even the old, uh, uh, ancestors who were signing concessions uh, with the white colonialists during, before, uh, during colonial rule, I don't think at all they entered into such kind of uh, transactions. But that tells you that there is something fundamentally wrong. Mm -hmm. And these are the resources that we must be able to guard jealously. First of all, minerals at some point will, will be exhausted. You're talking about your timber, will be exhausted. When you are talking about land, when you have each and every piece of land on title, that land is gone. It's completely out of your control. As we come to a conclusion, back to, again, the, the, the nitty gritties of this corruption fight, the president has been on record, obviously, at Parliament, and when he comments on this fight against corruption, I touched on this, that these corruption cases will now be taking a five-month period. Is it for the president to to really state that, that uh, what what yardstick is he using that, that these matters w w will be done and dusted in five months yeah i mean that that is all part of the of the of the lack of seriousness in terms of fighting these things and also it's an example of overreaching just like the chief justice was commenting on the issue to say uh, we're not happy about we're in the fight of uh, in the fight against corruption the president cannot intrude and begin to dictate what period judges should be able to uh, pro uh, determine these cases the very fact that you're even setting time limits that's a losing fight you're already in trouble. First of all, you cannot determine. That in itself, first of all, those provisions, in my opinion, they violate the Constitution because you cannot, that amounts to interference in the work of the judiciary. A judge is independent, is supposed to be independent and impartial in the administration of justice. The judge should not work under pressure. In any case, it's just crazy mm. that you can set uh, a five month uh, limit. What was the basis? What was the reference point? Is this, is this government really playing to the gallery? Because when they talk about achievements and successes scored, um, the access to information bill, for example, is one of them. And, and I refer to it because then they're saying they're laying transparency on the table. Mm -hmm. When the former board is calling to say we should be able to name, mm -hmm. you know, um, top government officials, including ministers, being investigated or mm -hmm. allegedly involved in corruption, mm -hmm. the ACC itself acknowledging that they're investigating mm -hmm. um, certain government officials, including the Solicitor General. Is this government trying to hide something that then they, they why can't we name? Mm -hmm. Yeah, officials being investigated in... in, in it, it boils down to issues of lawlessness, okay? First of all, the biggest culprit here would be the president because he's overreaching, okay? He's doing things because uh, I don't think at all he checks the law before he comments on these things. For example, if you look at Section 5 of the ACC Act, it clearly says that the ACC is independent, is not subject to the direction or control of any authority. Therefore, the president cannot even begin to talk about what they should do. If the ACC feels like it ought to name those people, they have to, because they are independent. The president should not even give instructions. Again, coming back to this example, in the genesis of the ACC, the ACC was created in 1990. The law was very clear that the ACC was a department of government reporting to the president. In that case, yes, it's correct. The president can give that instruction. But currently, the ACC is an independent organ. It is not subject to the control of anyone, not even the president. Now, the whole idea what is... What about the Gazette that is always argued over in terms of the investigative wings falling under the president's office? 
That is again uh, another misconception. What what it says is that uh, well, this is I know that about the statute you're talking about. That statute simply talks about the functions of the president. For example, uh, they will list what are the powers of the president, right, under the ACC Act. You find the ACC Act will appear there. Why does it appear? Because the president is responsible for the appointment of the DG and the board. That's the only reason. It lists the functions of the of the president. It does not mean, therefore, the ACC becomes under the control of the gov of the president. No, that's not what it means. Okay, but the actual act clearly states it is independent, not subject to the control of any organ or authority. Finally, said council, we are at a time where. The country does not have a board. It does not have a DG at the Anti-Corruption Commission. Mm -hmm. We introduced, uh, I mean, when you look at the Auditor General's report, mm -hmm. what comes out of there is financial leakages that one can point to financial mismanagement, mm -hmm. uh, irregularities, corruption, if you may say, mm -hmm. due to a flawed you know, procurement system. Mm -hmm. Money is leaving the country, like you've said, revealed through the FIC report in mm -hmm. terms of suspicious transactions and flagged banking transactions. Mm -hmm. I've referred to procurement because there was a recent introduction of the EGP system, mm -hmm. which sadly, just last week, we are hearing backtracking that now the system, either we should do away with it, uh, even huge sums of monies that are being pumped in in the name of decentralization and the CDF, we are now saying let's bring in political appointees called DC to have a say in this. Mm. Chaos. Mm -hmm. Has corruption in this country become so endemic and rooted that we are so stuck that we can't get out of it? We can. We can. I mean, I mean, uh, I remember my friend Shishua uh, wrote a piece where he says um, it's so easy to give up on Zambia than to defend f uh, and than to fight for her. Uh, but we have no choice but to fight for Zambia. We can't give up. We have to go on fighting. Now, what is required is that, you know, that's the beauty of democracy. In 2026, right, we'll be carrying out an assessment, okay? Do we give this government another five years or not? Or do we give a chance to anyone, uh, to somebody else? And that's the beauty of democracy. You have had your five years. At the end of that five years, we'll do a review. If we have, you have delivered on your promises, we'll give you another five years. You don't deliver, we'll give it to somebody else. Okay? And that is why it is important to celebrate our democratic system. They have had, um, uh, uh, this government had both local and international goodwill, but they have decided to squander that. Okay, and what you're talking about, such things should not be happening. What we should have done by this time, we should have managed to close all those loopholes and so forth and be able to clean up the system. But we're not, okay? And I mean, like I'm saying, you can have, when you're talking about, uh, is it uh, E system that you're talking the, about? Yeah, the EGP, the electronic government procurement system. All governments are moving towards electronic systems, okay? Because they try, they, they, they constitute a means of curtailing corruption and wastage. Okay. That is the way we should be able to, go, we should be going. But unfortunately, there is resistance. But what is required is to stick to those, uh, to those uh, ideals and be able to fight. And unfortunately, the fight against corruption is not something that we can give up. Because the damages that are being done, the damage that is being done by corruption is incalculable. Okay, we have no choice but to continue fighting, you know. So, uh, uh, like I said, I'm not one that believes in simply criticizing. I would suggest that the first thing, the first thing, if this government is serious, is to require all those who work in government, government-related institutions, government institutions that receive funding from government to be required to, to declare their assets. Now, that in itself would be a deterrent against corruption. So we shouldn't, uh, the, the system is designed to fight corruption once it has occurred. 
Okay? Now, it's not everybody. So if you are lucky, you are not caught by the system. You go scot free. But we need a system that prevents corruption in the first place. Okay? And it is also a fight that the people should be able to get uh, involved. So what is required, the fighting corruption will require government of the day being committed and the people also getting involved in the fight against corruption. Otherwise, all what we'll be doing is simply throwing slogans around whilst this country sinks deeper into misery. State Council John Sangwa, thank you for talking to me this evening. Thank you very much for having me. We've been discussing three years of the New Dawn administration in relation to the fight against corruption. My guest, State Council John Sangwa. Remember, it's live on Diamond TV Zambia. That's our YouTube page. Um, subscribe if you've not yet subscribed and obviously stand yourself a chance to be lucky. You could be walking away with a Diamond Media Power Bank and uh, one month's internet data courtesy of Zamtel. Uh, catch a repeat episode tomorrow morning as well as on Tuesday evening at 22.30. Good night. to you by FQM Trident Limited, a subsidiary of First Quantum Minerals Limited.